All right, let's get started. Hey guys, welcome back from lunch. Everyone perk up a little bit, <laughs> get ready. We're gonna talk about project management solutions. And these are not solutions like you build, they are operational solutions. So I'm Susan Fenema, I'm the Chaos Eradicating Officer for Beyond the Chaos. And we create operational systems for small businesses and for small internal uh, departments. So if you're looking for a little help with your project management or your structure, that's what Beyond the Chaos does. So a little bit about me. I'm fairly new to the Zojo community. Um, I am a non-technical, non-certified project manager. So my approach is very simple. It is not make a whole bunch of charts and graphs and make it look pretty. It is approach your project with very simple structure to help you get to the end of your project. I am a huge technology lover, kind of a little bit of a geek in that, in that way. I help a lot of my clients who are doing things on paper and that kind of thing come into a more cloud-based paperless world. So I do love technology. I'm also a home chef. I love to cook. And if you've ever tried to make a seven course dinner for 12 people in an 800 square foot condo, you will know that there's a lot of project management that goes into that. So I get to combine both of the things that I love uh, when, I, when I do those kinds of things. I am also the daughter, the sister, the best friend of small business owners. So it's been in my life forever. I love small business. I love to see the effects that you can have in a small business, different from huge corporations. So enough about me, let's get on with you guys. How many of you struggle with finishing your projects? Just a show of hands. Not sure if the rest of you are lying or just not answering. <laughs> what about scope creep? Any scope creep come in? Yeah. Do you feel like you get pulled in multiple directions and you don't know who to respond to? Or you don't know what's next on your list? Okay, that's good. In general, are your projects running you, or are you running them? And that's where we want to get to, is where you are in charge of running them. So all projects, they start with a proposal. And if you're starting later, you're missing some steps. So with proposals, one thing is you don't want them to be more than three pages. If it's more than three pages, you're asking your client to agree to something they don't understand. And they're not going to read. It's too much. If you do discovery first as one of your first steps, that can be its own proposal. But in this, I'm talking more about the actual project planning proposal. So if you do a discovery proposal first, this, what we're talking about, is more the project that comes from that discovery. You want to define your scope very clearly by what the client gets. Not necessarily what you're going to do, but what the client's gonna get. So not technical specifications. They don't understand that and they're not gonna read it. And in the end, when you want to go back to something to define the scope, you're not on the same page. So the proposal is setting that stage with your client to start off with everyone understanding what you're getting to. And if you're giving them a bunch of technical stuff, they're lost. So what you can say is something like, I'm going to deliver you a one page, sequentially numbered invoice that includes a place to enter a PO number and a payment received. It's gonna have six line items and it calculates sales tax by tax and includes shipping information. It's pretty clear and it's very defined, and they know what they're getting. Other thing you wanna make sure is that you're presenting a timeline or a deadline in that proposal. I know sometimes it's hard to set a due date if you don't know when they're gonna sign the proposal. So put an expiration date on your proposal. That also drives the sales process to get them to actually sign it. If you're doing this internal, if you're an internal uh, department, this applies as well as far as getting budgets approved. So just think, in, when, when I'm saying client, think internal client. 
internal other departments you have to present to, your internal clients. So once you have that in there, and it can be, um, it can be a duration, so you can say it's gonna be six to eight weeks, or it can be an actual date. I prefer the actual date. Um, that actually gives you something to build a timeline against once your project starts. Um, but if you're gonna do an estimated time frame, that's okay too, as long as you're setting some expectation of when it's gonna be delivered. A duration is not your estimated hours. So you guys all know that. If you say it's gonna take you eight hours to do it, as far as a budget goes, that doesn't mean the client's getting it in eight hours. But that's something to make clear as part of your proposal that that's not the same thing to them. One way that you can cut back on that deadline of, well, we don't know how long it's gonna take because what if they have changes and what if they're bugs and how long are those gonna take to fix? So what you can say in your proposal is, you are going to receive something to test on this date. And then you have something that is more in your control to manage. Obviously, you want to make sure you have a budget and payment terms, part of it. Um, you know, if you're doing a fixed price versus an estimated number of hours, it really doesn't matter. The client sees that number as the number what they're paying. So your estimated hours in their head, it's probably still a fixed price. So remember that when you're putting that in there too. All right, moving to payment terms. That's the other thing you wanna make sure is defined. So how do you get paid? Do you get paid up front? Are you doing a bank of hours? Maybe you're selling 10 hours and those get refilled after they get spent. Maybe you have staged payments, so maybe it's the you know, beginning of the project in two months and at the end. Although I'm gonna, hesit I'm, I'm gonna caution you guys on putting any sort of payment associated with a milestone. So if you're gonna do staged payments, I would say something more along the lines of you know, in three weeks, in six weeks, in nine weeks, as opposed to when we give you the first round of testing or when we've completed bugs. If you can associate it with a time frame, it's a little bit easier for you to stay in control of that instead of clients taking away that leverage and you ending up, you know, bending over backwards and fixing bugs forever until they're satisfied to pay you. Other is, um, and, and I, that's really what I was talking about, is after acceptance, I wouldn't do that. So if you're gonna do stage payments, do it against time. Okay, so we've got an agreement with our client, we're all on the same page, we know what to do, except now we need to move into setting up the actual project to execute the work. Please use some project management software. I would encourage you guys not to build it I know that is what all of you want to do, but there are plenty of options off the shelf. I'm going to recommend if you are not using any sort of project management tool, look at Basecamp 2, not 3, that's the newest one. I don't like that one as much. Get Basecamp 2. If you are already using project management software, you can look at Teamwork as something that gives you a lot more. Um, those, are, those are my favorites, but there are plenty out there. If you don't like those, please just pick something and make it work. You can build your process around that tool. Start with a custom template. So what goes in your template? All of the standard steps surrounding a project, but your template is not going to include the steps for the actual development you're gonna have all of the things, uh, there's no development task, it's all of the things about, okay, how do you install the software? Do you have licensing? Do you have to remind yourself to renew their licenses down the road? Um, when do you have kickoff meetings? And how often do you have status meetings? And 
all of the things you do to set up a project. It might even be things like reminding yourself to invite the client into your project management tool. So the, the template is all those things that you don't want to have to remember, that you just do every single time. And then when you open your project, you can actually pull in the development process and steps from your proposal. So you can take this from discovery all the way through testing and bug completion. So you, in your template, you can have the standard discovery questions you ask. So you don't have to remember them or have a document somewhere else. And then also, as you get those answers, you can put them into the tool. Then they're there for you to refer back to and to share with your team if they're not involved in that initial discovery part. You can even go through all the testing. How do you do testing consistently for you? Do you do an internal alpha testing with your team? Do you have quality assurance somehow with your team? Those steps should be consistent for every project. And then there's also probably client testing as well. So you want to put those things in your template to get your project kicked off. And then the next thing is to schedule the project, of course. So you have your steps. Let's bring in the actual schedule. And that's the whole project, not just your next two steps. <laughs> schedule the whole project. You know the date or the time frame that you've told the client you're going to deliver it in, so start backing it out. Sometimes if you do that, you will find that maybe you should have started last week. <laughs> so that's a good heads up that you need to pick up the pace or even perhaps be able to have that initial conversation with the client and say, listen, we're looking at the timeline and can we do it a week later? You know, start at the beginning knowing what that is, and that's going to get you more, uh, more in sync with your client. So also, you can include your bug and testing time in your uh, project. If you've included that in your proposal of how long you're going to allow bugs to last, and I do encourage that, you can then schedule that. So if you've said, hey, client, we're going to deliver you something to test. You have 30 days to test it. We'll fix any bug you find in 30 days for free. You're encouraging them to do the testing, which we all know is a challenge. And you're giving them a reward if they get you feedback during that time. After the 30 days, your project is over. You can enter into a support agreement with them, and then you can figure out how they might pay for new bugs that they find. We all know custom software has bugs. So, you know, them knowing that up front is not a bad thing. And if you set that expectation, um, you, can, you can make sure that then you know how to schedule your project through to the end. There are tons of ways to schedule. There's the waterfall, that's everything to the end. Um, there's phased, where you're doing one module and then the next module on different times. And of course, there's the agile method that you're constantly development and rolling things over. All of those things can be scheduled, though, based on the expectations you set with your client in the proposal. Part of the problem, of course, is after you've scheduled it, how do you make sure you do it? And I'm a firm believer in calendar blocking. So if in your mind you've said, developing this invoice we talked about will take 16 hours. Where are you going to, when are you going to do it? Block it out in your calendar, whether it's four or four hour blocks or two eight hour blocks, however you're going to do it, block it out. That also makes sure that you are allowing yourself time to focus on your development instead of letting all of the other business interruptions take over that time. And then, then honor your commitment to your meeting to yourself. The other thing that that does, when you calendar it, you'll start to be able to tell when you can start your next project. When your calendar blocks run out, you know, can you squeeze something else in? And once you do this too, make sure that you're allowing enough time for support on your other projects <laughs> because those are going to come in. So don't fill your whole day. So 
projects generally are going to start off with a kickoff call. I encourage this for all projects. You want to have all of the players in it your financial and operational decision makers, your developer, your tech lead, your project manager, whoever is involved, the client's lead, the client project champion, anybody that's surrounding this project should be in it, your kickoff. The first thing you wanna do is you wanna review that scope that you decided on. Because you might be bringing new players in as opposed to the people who originally decided it. This is, again, an opportunity everyone get on the same page. Understand what's going on. Then discuss the milestones that you've built. This is the timing that we're going to do things in. This is what you should expect. You can make sure, you know, we'll, we'll be testing or we'll be judging this every week as we meet, and we'll make sure you know where the progress is. Since you have those milestones, you can verify people's schedules versus your milestones. So if all of a sudden, like, okay, well, we're going to be ready to test on June 1st. Okay, yeah, but my kid graduates, and I'm taking him to Spain for June. Okay, well, they're not going to test it. <laughs> so you, at that point, have the opportunity to reset expectations and reschedule that. So, you know, maybe their testing starts in July and you've just bought yourself an extra month to build. Um, but setting that up front is important. Another rule of thumb, obviously, if you have retail clients, don't schedule them a whole bunch of changes in December. If you have accounting clients, don't, cha don't schedule them a whole bunch of changes in testing in early April. I mean, you know, just keep that in mind that you are building a tool for your client for them to do their job. And while this is all you think about, it's just their tool to do what they're already doing. So that is working into their world. All right, moving on, let's talk about scheduling status meetings. Status meetings are a very important part of a project. You want to make sure that at that kickoff meeting, you get some pre-scheduled. And I'm not talking about our first status meeting will be next Monday. I'm talking about every Monday at 2 o'clock, we're going to have a status. Now, should somebody need to move one? That's fine. But if it's on the calendar, you're going to, you're going to be more likely to meet it. The entire team should also be included in that status. So it's not, the purpose of the status is not to dive into deep detail on what you're actually developing. It's not for ongoing discovery. It's to give all players an update of where you are. So you want to try to get all of the players in that, including the development team. So things that you can discuss. The progress versus the milestone schedule, for sure. Where are you versus the timeline? What are the next steps? The other is progress versus the budget. How much of your budget have you spent up? If it's a fixed price, are you on target or all of a sudden did something come up that's changed it? And we'll talk about change management in a minute. But if something's changed it, you want to make sure that you're addressing those things as well. Obviously, next steps, what are we doing next? Also, any outstanding needs. What are you waiting on from the client? Do you need a file from them? One of the things these status meetings do, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, more meetings, oh, it's horrible. But one of the things these status meetings do is that it's going to help you avoid interruptions. Your client's going to know when they're going to talk to you next, they're going to know when they are going to get an update, and they're not going to be as many surprises to them. So you're not going to get phone calls, and you're not going to get emails. They're going to say, oh, I'm talking to them on Monday. I'll just ask then. So eliminating those interruptions is going to help you be able to focus more on the tasks you need to perform to, to get them to where they need to be. 
If things come up where you need to schedule deep dives into a, a specific thing, in that status meeting, you can schedule that separately. So you don't have to have all those people for that one conversation. That might take two hours instead of a half hour. A status meeting should not take more than half an hour. It might even be faster if you're prepared. Other thing you can do too is show your progress. So share your screen if you're doing it virtually and show your progress. And one of the things that's gonna help is that uh, you feel like you have to have made progress before that status meeting. So you are gonna have that obligation in the back of your mind of, oh, I better have something ready to show them. So we've done it, right? We've got a structure. We're all on the same page. We're ready to go. This is gonna be a breeze except changes. We all know it happens. No, progress, no project is gonna be exactly how it started out. So there are different ways to manage changes. Really what you wanna do as far as change is prevent the project from totally going off the rails. You've done discovery up front, so you and your client are on the same page at the beginning of what you're trying to create. If things come in that change that a lot and you just accept it, you haven't given that change request from the client the same uh, uh, attention that you gave the project at the beginning. So how is that gonna change it? How is that gonna affect it? Do they even really need it? All of those things, if they come up at the last minute, are things to wonder about. And as you're thinking through those things, you need to make sure that you have a place to capture um, those changes. So a, a project that's never delivered has no value to the client. So it doesn't matter if you're billing by the hour and you've, you've got six, you can add 10 hour blocks until the end of time. If they don't have something, they're eventually gonna get frustrated. So as the professional, it's really your job to try to, to limit them and hold them into something that they can get that will work for them. You can always add the other stuff later. You're not ever really saying no, you're more saying not now. So, no project management at all can help if the communication about consequences isn't allowed by the owner or the tech lead, so the, the company owner or the, the tech lead on the project. If they, won't, if they won't say or they won't let a project manager say um, there is a consequence to this change, it is more time or it is more money, then it doesn't matter how good your project management is, at the end you're gonna have an unhappy client. You have to be able to have that open and honest communication as you go through the project. So I have a little story about that. I was brought into a client situation about probably 12 months after they had started the project. The project was off the rails. Um, it was a fixed price project that had been paid up front. It was a big dollar amount. It was horribly scoped. My first question was, oh, it's due in a month? What's due in a month? Nobody could answer the question. The client couldn't answer it. <laughs> My client, the development team, couldn't answer it. Nobody even knew what they were shooting for to deliver. So all I could do over that next month is put out fires, cross my fingers, and hope that what they put out there was what they wanted. Well, shockingly, it was not at all what they wanted. <laughs> so a year later, they have just now delivered it. And even after that, in that second year of development, there was still a lot of pushback from the development company to communicate clearly to the client what their changes were causing. They, they put no limits on the client, they just wanted them to do everything and then when it was more money, more money, more money, more time, the client is angry and they don't even understand that they've asked you to change what was intended. And that's what's important to know. Don't 
ever assume that, well, of course they know that they've changed something. Or of course they know if they asked for this that wasn't originally planned. They don't. Half the time they're just talking. <laughs> oh, it'd be great if we had that. Okay, let's go do it. Don't go do it. Talk about how that affects the overall plan. Let the client choose whether you're gonna spend more time or more money on it. It's totally okay for them to decide it, but if they are being told after the fact that this request caused this, and they don't have an opportunity to say, no, nah, let's do it later or let's hold off, that's how you get angry clients. This client is actually happy now, <laughs> but it took two years to deliver a one-year project and a lot more money than was originally planned. So um, one of the important ways to manage those changes is to create a wish list. And I would suggest if you're building a, cu a custom template for your, your software or your uh, project management software, go ahead and add wish list as a task list to the very bottom of your template. This is a place that when clients ask for something new, you can put, put it on there. Maybe it's a someday maybe. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe the clients are like, oh, it'd be great if one day we could do this. Capture that, put it on there. If they're saying, oh, I would also like my invoice to be able to go to three pages and 10 lines, which is not what we defined, you can put that on there and say, you know, let's start with the first one. If that doesn't work for you, we can add it. And if we get to the end of the project and we find out we have contingency budget left or time left, we could see if we can push it into this one. If not, you're building yourself a next phase list in that wish list, which any small business owner in here right now should be hearing more money, new project, and also an ongoing client who's happy and is excited that, oh, these things are gonna come still, willing to work with you in the long run. All of this means you have to manage projects like you mean it. Not being willy-nilly, not you know seeing how it goes. You have to drive the project, not the client. As we talked about, they, this is not what they do. This is what you do. You're the professional. You know how it works. Um, I recently had a client who hired me as a, a coach for them to be able to manage their own internal implementation of NetSuite. Very quickly, the client thought they were gonna have to manage it. They didn't know how, they didn't know who they should put on this, they didn't know how much effort it was gonna take, they didn't have a project manager on staff. Well, it turns out that after we started working together briefly, we put a little bit of structure around what they were gonna do. It turns out NetSuite came with a project manager and a project manager tool. So they managed it and it went great because they were the professional and they knew what they were doing as opposed to making that client figure it out. So you need to do that. Um, saying no is a big part of it. And I don't mean be mean and I don't mean oh, the, the project is the project and you can't veer from it. I don't mean anything like that. I mean saying no in the best interest of your client and in a nice way. So instead of no, not now, later. And that wish list works. Now if you come up with something that all of a sudden changes the whole scope of your project, well that is a yes, we're gonna stop right now and we're gonna reassess everything and we're gonna see how that changes the scope, the budget, and the timeline. And that's okay. But if it is not a dramatic change, I highly encourage you just to wait. If there are little bitty things, just do them. But also don't go down rabbit holes with those little bitty things too. If they, hey, can I have my invoice be 10 lines instead of six? Maybe that's an easy fix, great, so you do it. But make sure they know that that wasn't in scope. Hey, yeah, uh, no problem. Uh, that's not what we talked about originally, but I can do that. That's not a big deal. That way, if it goes off the rails, because all of a sudden you're spending 10 hours figuring out how the 
printer works with this or something like that, you can say, okay, we have to stop. You know, I, I know I said I could do this, but it's, it's, it's gone a little further than I expected. And it's not in the original scope. And since you told them up front, they know that that's okay to expect. You want to make sure that you're always communicating clearly with your client. And you want to make sure that things have consequences when, and, and I don't mean mean consequences. I mean, hey, if I don't get that invoice layout from you by Friday, I can't get this development done for you next week. We're going to be off schedule. And really, it also could cause an additional monetary outlay for you, because if it's too delayed and I get too far removed from the project, I'm not gonna remember where I was and that's gonna take more time, which will be more hours. Then you're letting your client decide whether their internal work is more important than what might be the consequence. But if they don't know the consequence and you just say, yeah, I need that layout from you. Friday comes and goes, you don't have anything to do, it's been three weeks, you're still waiting, and then they get it to you and you're like, oh, yeah, well, now, it's, now we're gonna be late, now we're over budget. Well, now they didn't get to make a decision. You took that decision away from them. So that clear communication with consequences is very important. So I go um, deeper on a lot of these concepts on my blog. So if you wanna go to beyondthechaos.biz slash blog, there's a lot of uh, saying no and deeper dives into these things. So please feel free to take a look at those. <sighs> Testing and support. All right. So this is all a part of perhaps your original project and then also your next project. So at the end of testing is where you kind of want to turn off the project and turn it into support. Long-term agreement with them to you know, maybe you fix bugs for free, maybe you uh, install updates. There could be all sorts of arrangements that you make in a support agreement for a fixed amount that they pay you. Or maybe they just do a bank of hours that you work against. But you wanna get to that support. So by scheduling testing, we talked about alpha and maybe beta testing. You can do that however you guys do it internally. Everybody can do this differently. But making sure that somebody internally has run through it from a client perspective, not from a developer perspective, from the user perspective. Good way to do that is make a movie to show your client how to do it. You'll find amazing results of how many times those movies end in, oh, curse word. Because <laughs> you have to go in and fix something. So make a little movie that demos to your client how to do it, and then at that same time, you're testing your work. The beta testing usually involves them. Maybe, you know, some core users. It could also be that it's rolled out to everyone. So if you're, you're doing that, that's also something to make sure they understand it's beta, there will be bugs. So if you have people that aren't really comfortable with buggy software or being able to report bugs clearly, maybe that beta testing needs to not be rolled out to everyone, maybe just a small group. And then of course, bug fixes. You need to include that as part of your plan. You shouldn't be surprised when you get to the end that there are bugs. Your client shouldn't be surprised either. So make sure that that's part of it. And then ongoing support. Your client at the end of the, the project is often worried. Oh, are you just gonna leave me? It's gonna happen. Make sure that they know that you're there for them, that you're there you know, long-term to help support them and their work. Now, what happens usually when you get to this stage is a whole bunch of interruptions of people out of the blue emailing you with something that now is an emergency. They've interrupted your day or calling. Get a tool that lets you support them. I highly recommend Zendesk. If you're using Teamwork for project management, they also have Teamwork Desk. It is not as uh, feature 
uh, large, I don't know if that's a right phrase, it doesn't have as many features <laughs> as Zendesk does, but it is available to help track those. And you can usually send emails into these things, like support at your domain name. So the client has that as part of their support agreement. They email in there, and now you have a, a system to manage ongoing support with your clients. So that kind of pulls us into finishing the project. So we want to get to the point where we're going to close it. We actually want to close it. <laughs> and now these steps are things that also can be part of your template, your custom template for a project, is what you do when you close it. Send a final invoice if that's applicable to, to your, your process. Here's a big one. Say thank you. Sometimes you actually have to remind yourself that you need to thank someone for trusting you with their business. But put that as, put that as a task to yourself. Many of these softwares will let you hide task lists from a client. I would suggest that this close, these closing steps be hidden from them. You don't want them to know that you are having to remind yourself to say thank you. <laughs> you might create a quick help page or videos for them to refer back to. Um, that might be one of your steps to explain how the solution works, kind of document it. You can charge more for that. You can tell your clients it's up to them to do it, or you can offer to do it for a certain price. That might be an option you put in your, in your proposal. This is a suggestion. Also make sure you check in about a month after they're using the software. And this is part of that schedule. You're actually putting that as a date, assigning it to you in your project software. Find out how they're doing. Find out if they like it. Find out if they're having any problems. Find out if they want to look at those next group of things on their wish list to implement. This is a sales tool. It's also a customer satisfaction tool. So make sure that that reminder is a big one. Here's another step. Are you asking for permission to use their work in your portfolio, on your website? Ask them if they will refer you to another client. Ask them if you can use them as the reference down the road. All of these things you can package up as your sales tool for your next project or, you know, for them. And then, as the last step, you want to close the project out of your project management software because you're done, <laughs> and that eliminates clutter from you looking at all the open projects you have. So let them know, hey, we're closing this down, project's over, if you need anything else, you can send an email into the support desk at, or if you're not using a support desk, you can have them email you. And then you can always reopen the project if there are more steps to go. So that is most of, well, I guess it's really project management in a nuts, nutshell, but I will tell you, it's a lot harder than that when you get in the midst of it. But that will give you some good structure to build around. I am going to give you guys a special offer. Um, if you want help building a custom template, uh, please let me know. I will offer a free month of support and coaching after that template for help with implementation. Just use the code XDC2018, um, and I'll honor this through the end of June. And of course, give me feedback on the app, and I will take questions. Oh, come on. Yes. So most of the projects we have involve a lot of other players. Mm -hmm. like tenants, or trading portals, or other things that we're integrating. OK. So how do we manage it in, because a lot of these things are in our control. You know, so we set a schedule and we can think of this. It's going to take X number of months to complete this. Then you've got these other outfits who have their different ideas about how long they're going to take. So how do we 
is there a good way of folding that back in and saying, okay, so Bank of America said they're going to take three years to do this. We thought it was still going to be. Sure. There's is that stuff that's available in the project management software. It's it's more of a project management as a function. So the question is, if you have other players outside of your immediate team that might have an impact on your timing, um, a, an outside vendor or an outside resource that has their own world <laughs> of when things should be done, how do you coordinate that in with the schedule? Does that sound about right? Yeah. Okay. So... In that instance, what you want to do first is make sure you're talking to them and find out how long they think it's going to take, and then tell them you're expecting it by that date. You also can hold them accountable to some degree. Now, if they don't meet their deadline, you can explain that to your client in your status meetings and say, as you know, we were expecting Bank of America to deliver this on this date. They have now gotten back to us and told us it won't be until this date. Sadly, we don't have control over that. So with that, we're rebuilding your schedule, and now we'll be able to deliver on this date. But you do want to coordinate with those vendors as you build that first schedule and make sure that they're on board. And even if you can talk with them during the project man or during the proposal stage and get an idea from them how long these things that you're relying on them might take, that will give you a better feel for how long you should allow in your initial timeline. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. I've got one other question. Sure. To that. So, so one of the solutions is, typically, would be interacting with maybe six or seven different banks in this project to integrate with them. So do you have a metric on, you know, so naturally you want to kind of do some of that in parallel as opposed to just one bank after the next, mm -hmm. and then two years later. Do you have any metrics on on what you can practically, how many of those things you can have going on in parallel? So the question is, how many parallel vendor projects can you have going on at one time? Yeah. Right? In, in, practical in, in practical terms. There is not any sort of metric I can give you to say, not more than three. I can't tell you anything like that. It's really about what is your capacity to manage the project, and to manage the vendors. So if you, feel, if you feel like I'm a business owner and I have 20 other projects and I'm responsible for the project management, I can probably only do two at a time. Then you know that. If you have a full-time project manager or a subcontracted project manager, then maybe you can rely on them to manage that vendor for you and maybe you can do all of them at one time. It really depends on the scope that you're and how much effort it's going to take from your part to manage it. Just be realistic with your own time. And be realistic from, and, and I guess, um, again, that clear communication with your client about the realistic situation too. So that they, the big thing is that you don't want your client to be surprised. So if you are continuing that communication with them and explaining that it's taking longer to work with this vendor than you expected, or even that they're more difficult, <laughs> you can get them to be more accepting in the end and not frustrated. Anyone else? We have a few more minutes. Yeah. How do you communicate with uh, your clients on definitions, particularly what they might be calling as a bug? Yet, you might uh, think of more as just an addition of the scope. Okay. You say it's like, well, hey, it doesn't do this thing, it's a bug. And then you say it's like, well, we have a responsibility as a vendor to scope the addition and, and scope the process. So the question is, how do you explain to your client the difference between a bug, a tweak, and an omission? Right. So you just, you just have to tell them. And it might... It might be, um, and it might be based on each individual one. Now, if you can develop as part of your template some training for your client, maybe an email that goes out to them regularly 
before you start your testing process that explains this is a tweak, this is a bug, this is an omission. You might find all of these in your solution. We fix bugs for free. We might do a tweak for you for free, but an omission we're gonna talk about. So again, that communication is important. If you don't do it up front, you can do it on each individual one. It might take a little bit more explaining. And if you're having regular status meetings and showing them as you go, as you create, you're gonna have less of the omission. You might have some of the, it doesn't work, you know, we all hear that. Well, then you're gonna to have to get down to, well, why doesn't it work? Is, it, is the technology wrong? You know, did, did we forget a field? <laughs> or did we actually never intend it to work that way? Sometimes clients will find a bug and you're like, but that's not a bug, that's a feature. <laughs> that's how we wanted it to work. So just having that communication with them, you do have to educate them on it. They don't understand the difference of this is just not working. But those three things are different. And if you educate them as part of your process as you go, um, I do that a lot. M my template includes each phase of the project and standardized email that can go out explaining to them where they are, how to use the software, all of those things. That would be a great standardized email to put right before you start testing. Anything else we have? Well, maybe a minute. All right, I am around, I will be here. Catch me after, catch me at dinner, whatever. If you have more questions, I'm happy to help you with individual challenges and anything else like that. Thanks guys for having me.